This is The Crucible. The JRTC Experience. This is, if I would have only known, a candid conversation with leaders. In this series, we discuss brigade combat team warfighting skills and lessons learned in a decisive action training environment for large-scale combat operations at JRTC. Hi, I'm Colonel Matt Hardman. I'm the commander of operations group here at the the Joint Readiness Training Center uh, for Polk, Louisiana. Uh, You are here with us the day after the great fight in Arnland. Uh, with some awesome captain planners from the Bastone team and a great rotation and a ton of fun. Would you introduce yourself, please? Yes, sir. I'm Captain Pamela Donay. I am the chief of plans. I've been in the seat for 11 months now. My background, uh, I was a former MP and then branch transferred to armor when combat arms opened up to females. Uh, so went to A. Bullock, went to 3CR, deployed to Iraq, uh, went to Triple C, went to SVAB. Um, did exo time in SVAB, then troop command, and then PCS to Fort Campbell to this seat, sir. Okay, awesome. All right, where are you from? New Hampshire originally, sir. Okay. Yes. And where in New Hampshire? Plymouth. Plymouth? C- Central. It's like poke, yeah. poke, a map, poke, poke the center of New Hampshire right on the map. All That's right. where I'm Where'd from. you go to school? Norwich, sir, in Vermont. Okay, outstanding school. Yes, sir. All right. All right. Uh, Captain Nick Lissandrola. I go by Nick, but um, infantry officer, and I'm currently the brigade training officer, and I serve as a TAC OIC out in the field. Uh, some of my backgrounds, uh, graduated I. Bullock in 2016 now, then I uh, went to ranger school, decided to take the long way and spend Thanksgiving and Christmas there. So that was a blast. But uh, It's good work if you can get it. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But it, uh, worth all the time. Definitely need the development there. Highly recommend. <laughs> but um, then made my way over to Fort Bliss, uh, 1st Striker Brigade, 1st uh, Armored Division back when it was a striker. Uh, did my PL XO time there. I which, was full- which battalion were you in? I was in 417 Buffaloes and then 341 okay. uh, Rifles. Right on. So they're both great organizations to work for. Uh, but then they reflect, so yeah. figures. But um, And then I got the opportunity to, to go over to RASP-2 and then um, had the opportunity to serve two years in 75th Ranger Regiment up on their uh, regimental operation shop. And then I uh, went to the career course. Uh, loved it. Great course. And then PCS'd over to Fort Campbell where uh, I now do my current job as the training officer. Okay. And where are you from originally? Originally from Aurora, Illinois. So if you're, um, it's about an hour yeah, west of Chicago. Yeah, that's where, yeah, um, yeah that's uh, Wayne's World. Yeah, exactly, right. Wayne's World. All right, and wh- mm-hmm. where'd you go to school? Uh, so I went to school, Loyola University of Chicago, stuff on the north side in yeah. um, Rogers Park. So they got they got real popular a few years ago when they went on NCAA Final Four tournament at Sister Jean, everyone loves her. She's oh, yeah. just as good as they say. Yeah. She is a saint, and okay. she, she is dead on with her basketball predictions. So when it comes to March Madness time, Listen to her. She knows what she's okay. talking about. I know a little something about March Madness. I went to Davidson College in North Carolina, uh, where Steph Curry recently uh, finished and graduated, and then you know has gone on to do amazing things. Well, awesome. Mm-hmm. Hey, uh, thanks for joining us today. And um, you know, up front, like uh, you know, if you told me when I was leaving the career course, I was going to get the opportunity to serve on a brigade staff, you know, I probably would have run in a, diff- in, in a different direction. Uh, you, you both had the opportunity to serve, uh, you know, at the brigade level. You got to serve at the regimental staff at the range regiment. Um, you know, what, what were your expectations coming in, and what what did you think when you found out you were going to be a brigade staff officer coming to the Joint Readiness Training Center? Oh man, devastated, <laughs> sir. Devastated. devastated. All right. So, what were so, some of uh, your kind of uh, what what were you anxious about coming? So for sure, sir, coming out of Triple C, we're all anxious to take command. That's all they talk about in Triple C. So when you show up, you know, you think you're the best of the best. You're going to go right into troop command. And then they tell you you're serving on brigade staff. And I've had no experience with brigade staff before, no no experience at that higher level echelon. So I was very, very overwhelmed to begin with. Um, Once once I got in, it took a couple months, you know, to get used to the battle rhythm and get used to our our expectations and our scope. And then... uh, they hit us that we're going to JRTC in September. Start start getting ready. Start planning. And I was like, start start planning for what? I don't know what that is. Um, so we started started pulling out old products from 2018 when First Brigade came here. Start digging into that. Come to find out, we are now in Lisco, and nothing we did before is really going to be helpful. So uh, got the team together and just did a bunch of reps 
at MDMP to try to get us ready, sir. Okay. Um, yeah, and then, um, yeah, when I got here and they're telling us, like, JRTC, well, well, first off, brigade staff, like, everyone wants to go down to battalion. Everyone wants to go take, company, you know, company troop battery command, just like, just like Pam said. So getting, get, being on the brigade staff, you're like, oh, here we go. I'm like, I just got to row the boat and then we'll get there eventually. But um, <laughs> it, it was interesting, though, to, to see the comparison between an IBCT conventional staff and then coming from somewhere like 75th where the battalions are so decentralized and do their own thing it's, it, they don't really truly operate like the like the ibct over here where you you know integrate every single piece of the puzzle then just getting ready for jrtc and there's we, like a dozen know, of you at the range regiment yeah in, and, our, in yeah. a s3 shop right? yeah and just, just like pam said you think you're you think you're the best you go there and you, you get humbled really really quickly so yeah but um that, that's always for the better always for the better but yeah, for the train up for JRTC and uh, falling into the training officer gig, that was kind of a weird one. Like plans, you obviously, you know, you work in the, the FUOP side and then you have your current operations guys or chopsters. Where does the training officer fall into that? This is kind of a weirdo one. So I, in, the, in the field, in our tactical scenarios and our tactical training, I become the TACO I see. So I kind of serve as the link between the FUOPs, the plans, and then over to the COOP side of the house. So as we go through the MD uh, military decision making process, and we work through all seven steps of that. I will be alongside, but the plan team will help, assist, you know, do whatever I can. And really just digest it as much as I can. So then when the final order gets pushed, we brief the operations order. We do the combined arms rehearsal. And that finally goes over to the co-ops realm. I can take that plan, have good knowledge of it. And then when, um, you know, B6 or B3, they want to push the TAC package out, the tactical assault command post to do some close fight controlling, then I, ha I have a good understanding of, of what the operation entails, what we're doing, and kind of how to present that information to B3 or B6 or whoever really needs to know on the net. Right on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you guys, so you're here because I got to watch you guys and I got some great feedback from uh, you know, the team and, and both of you, you know, really performed well. So don't let that Thanks, explode man. your head. And hopefully, Fast Zone 6, if you're watching, they want to <laughs> command it. You know, <laughs> Pam wants to command a troop and uh, you know, Nick wants to command a company. All right. Um, so, uh, you know, did you come to LTP? I did. Leader yes, sir. training program. We both did. Were yes, you sir. here for LTP? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, what uh, what in LTP? You know, building on your experience coming out of Triple C and then into LTP. You know, what did you learn at LTP? Um, and then how did that really transfer over? You know, as you prepared and, and ended up here fighting at JRTC. I think that everyone has their own way of doing business. Like, obviously, in the schoolhouse, that they have their own method, and it's a familiarization, right? Become master of the troop leading procedures, become familiar with military decision making process. And so, when we came to LTP, it was like it was MDMP on steroids. They yeah, and I think it's awesome you say that, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, at the company level, like their expectation is that you master the troop leadership procedures. You've been exposed to it. Um, as a lieutenant and certainly in, in, you know, the course of IBOLIC, uh, but even as a cadet and, you know, I've actually never heard anybody frame it the way you just framed it. Right. It's like, okay, I go to triple C, I become familiar with the military decision-making process uh, practiced, if you will, at, um, the battalion and the brigade level. Uh, I think you get one rep at M triple C at the brigade level. So, uh, I think it depends what team you're on. Yeah. So I was on their, their kind of their experimental team, team three is what they typically call it. And they go through all the new scenarios. So we had a, at least for TLPs, we had a Korea scenario for, um, for our MDMP iterations. We had, I think it was some seminars and we had one brigade or two brigade staff seminars, which of course somehow ended up on. That's so, good. That's probably good. why you got picked to be a the, I, I guess so, the sir, it was brigade staff. Just meant to be. Yeah. But it was it was cool to see the process because the brigade staffs would turn over an order in which the battalion seminars would then have to start their MDMP process. <laughs> and then to you know to, to keep things spicy, we also had one specifically for kind of our cavalry and our armor guys and gals that was specifically squadron based. So when you did kick out one or two, they started their MDMP process. Right so that was and, neat to see. And you know, and I think this idea that, you know, expectation wise that we're, we're familiar practice probably at the captain level, um, at, with MDMP and then, you know, it's experiences like LTP and JRTC that really 
cement that in. And then I would argue command general staff college is where we're getting to the level of mastery. Um, but I'd never heard anybody frame it that way. And it's pretty awesome. So uh, appreciate it. What about from your perspective? So we had SOPs going in as a, as a staff, but we never really executed. So we did. A, it's, a, it's the Mike Tyson, right? Yeah, Everybody's yeah. got an SOP until they get punched in the yes, face. And everything goes out the window. <laughs> um, and it's hard to repl replicate, too, in the rear because you have, you know, gray cycle taskings. You have gate guard. You have this. You can't just pull the whole staff and dedicate them to a, a full rep of MDMP. So bizarrely, I actually think that's realistic, right? It's hard from a training perspective because it's hard to, to make sure everybody's getting the sets and reps. But it's realistic. Did you ever have the staff all together? Almost never. Well, for the JFE, I think. For the, yeah, for the joint forcible one. entry yeah, there. Yeah. So. Yeah. But after that, that, it was it. like, no, they're him. a gate yeah. guard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't see the four ones. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. No, like, you're good, yeah, sir. So, so uh, <laughs> Yeah, so the development of the staff with SOPs at LPP. I mean, what at the leader training program, what what was the biggest thing you think you took out of that that prepared your team uh, for, for the rotation? I think just validating what we put on paper, getting to test it, and then making changes coming out of it, and having the classes. So having LTP structured, we get a class on what we're about to execute, um, just either we get exposed to it or we get prepared to go execute it. Um, so seeing what what one sort of right looks like and then our staff gets a chance to execute um, and then we were able to take some from the let from the lectures and then also what worked for us kind of meld it together into what we used and executed here for JRTC. Awesome okay um, so and I'm going to come back a little bit I'm going to take you back in the in the time machine here in a few minutes but um, you know large-scale combat operations right so uh, what did you you know what were your expectations of a large, you know, of a large scale combat operation rotation. And then, you know, what was reality from hmm. your perspective? Um, so I guess when you, when you think you, you hear the term large scale combat operations and when's the last time that we as an army, as a, you know, as a military has, have really done that. Really the only time I think probably like world war two, if you really think about it, like that scale of combat. Um, there, there were some other ones, like you yeah, have the Gulf War, that was pretty, you know, pretty sizable yeah. against the third largest army in the world. And we had our coalition partners and that was definitely an undertaking. There were a few others, but like that scale, I don't, it just at least our generation, like we're so used to the global war on terror tactics and, you know, those TTPs and that war for 20 years. And that's yeah, what tell we- Tell me about it. That's what we grew up, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know all about it, sir. <laughs> But uh, like that's what we grew up on, you know. I, I still remember, you know, like growing up during the surge years, like that's yeah. what you saw on TV. But um, it was all about like the small level tactics, the squad, and the platoons getting after it. Whereas you come into the large scale combat, um, large scale combat operations environment, and you're maneuvering the whole brigade. Those platoons and squads become your your battalions and your brigades, and potentially even divisions. So that even that was one of our initial challenges when we received the order. How do we as a brigade, as the Bastogne Brigade, fit into 21st Airborne's overall scheme of maneuver? That's something that we, we struggled to get a grasp of in the early days, but we eventually did. But really just thinking division, even core level schemes of maneuver, like that stuff hasn't been thought about in a very long time. Hasn't been dusted yeah, off at least. Certainly at the captain level. Oh, yeah. Right? That, it's and, daunting. And, and that's right. And, you know, and you all working on the plan, like had to wrestle with those things. Um, because the resources at the division level, you know, you, the brigade wants, and you're planning against those, and, the, and we're not giving them to you, or we are, but for a narrow window of time, and then expecting you to make the most use out of it, whether it's aviation task force, division level fires, or sustainment. Um, yeah, awesome. Yes, sir. Am. So so kind of what you're alluding to. So we got so comfortable having anything we wanted in Iraq and Afghanistan, you call for it, it's there for you. So it's using our own organic assets as our, maybe our primary plan or nothing else, our backup plan. You know, if, if weather happens, if something gets shot down or if it's diverted to the main effort, um, I, I don't think we did a great job coming in here planning for that. Um, but as we got reps and sets here at JRTC, it's, it's okay, what do we have organically that we can use, we can rely upon, um, you know, to have effects on the enemy? And then what is, what is the nice to have that we're gonna ask for, but, but being prepared to execute and get those get those effects or yeah i i and i thought i mean you framed that really well because 
it definitely it didn't it didn't take you all long as a brigade to pick up the beat and start really relying on the organic capabilities of the brigade. I mean, I think it, selling yourselves a little short, you did pretty well, but you got a lot better as time went on. Uh, particularly when we talk about fires uh, or, or shadow. I mean, you all flew more UAS hours uh, than than any brigade that's been through here in five years. Did you oh, know that? Yes, sir. Yeah. All right. And more uh, sustainment by sling load, so making use of those division resources, uh, than is combined in the last calendar year. Wow. Which is impressive. And that really gets to, to good effort, and it's good news for our Army as we're really, uh, I think, uh, coming in terms with exactly as you described it, like, hey, we got to make do with what we're given, mm -hmm. and we got to first make do with the organic resources uh, available. What was the biggest surprise um, of large scale combat operations here at JRTC for you? Uh, I, I would say seeing the whole team, like the entire, you know, brigade combat team, come together and and maneuver as such. It's not just like, at least from like. And a knuckle dragging infantry men's perspective. It's not just, you know, I mean, you shouldn't tell yourself story. You seem reasonably clever, reasonably. <laughs> Be careful, Wizard. but um, it, it's not just like moving the platoons or moving the yeah. companies. It's like, how are we going to sustain them? How are we supporting their maneuver with fires? Where are we putting our eyes so we know where to shoot the fires? Like, how are we talking between the different battalions, between battalion to brigade, brigade to division? Like the, the C2 chain, that, that's always a huge challenge for everyone, I think. Even just getting any from the 1523 ASIP all the way up to, you know, the upper tactical internet that we try to work. Yeah, and you had a front row seat with the TAC. Yes. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, a big pro tip, like, come in knowing a few things about, if, you know, your communication systems. Like, that'll be your lifeline out there between the battalions and then back to brigade main, back to division. Yeah. And so. It's crazy. I mean, it's the 10-level it's the level pass that even – we as officers have to be able to do, got to be able to, to fill a radio. Yeah, uh, like your RTO is not always there. That's right. Um, all right, what about you? The enemy was most surprising, sir. So Dreaded Geronimo? Geronimo. There's a million what? of them out there, I swear to goodness. Um, <laughs> there's not. There's only like 452 of them. They're, they're, they're <laughs> I get, incredible. I get their purse stack. Yeah. Somebody's just got a gun. gun. Just keep reading through yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, So just large-scale combat, you know, we're, we're attacking objective Subaru's big urban area. So in our minds, we have to take the city. All the enemy's going to be postured to defend that city. We can't even get to the city. We're telling our infantry battalions to go west, and they're facing you know, more enemy in that movement west than we than we planned for. So we're having to adjust our plan on the fly, give them assets on the ground. So it's, it's, you know, the enemy's kind of fighting in the wood line still, which which in, in Lisco we weren't really thinking, but of course they're going to be in their disruption zone. Yeah. And so we neglected our security zone, which definitely bit us a couple times. Um, so it's just not planning that whole movement as just one simple thing. Like you got to get to your objective. The enemy's going to be there, but they're also going to interfere with you the whole way there too. Right. Yes, and yeah. living, breathing, yeah, thinking enemy. Smart enemy. Um, yeah. And so, you know, yeah. I don't want to like, we're going to do an after action review later yeah. tonight, but uh, as the as the uh, division tactical group commander, I gave uh, Geronimo planning guidance and it was to, it was to retrograde um, uh, from east to west uh, and essentially trade space for time mm -hmm. and disrupt uh, your movement west um, and then uh, consolidate combat power, uh, objective Subaru, uh, again, disrupt uh, with disengagement criteria based on um, ability to in inflict casualties on the brigade, uh, but also a threshold that he had to preserve combat power. Uh, and then he retrograded north. And what did he do after we got to objective Subaru? Came back and hit us in the south. Violently yes. counterattacked. <laughs> right? Well. Violently counterattacked. Mm -hmm. I mean, once the brigade had been extended, and that really hard thing, the transition, yes. um, he, he saw an opportunity. He took that opportunity. He waited until the, the worst possible time, i.e. when you weren't going to have attack aviation, yeah. and he counterattacked uh, pretty effectively. But yes, you all did fight your way to objective Subaru, and I thought it was actually a pretty awesome fight. Um, in your comment, the reconnaissance security definitely got better over time. Sure. Um, you know, that Southern Avenue of approach, the ability to clear complex terrain with dismounted infantry supported with fires in the close fight enabled 
the troop, the reconnaissance troop, to get into zone and gain and maintain contact with the enemy. The other thing I thought y'all did really well was the dismounted maneuver. Um, and that actually hastened uh, Jerome's retrograde from objective super. You guys probably didn't know that. Mm -mm. Uh, and I didn't really know it until it, it, after it happened. I was like, hey, why are they withdrawing from objective Subaru already? Like, we haven't had as much of a fight as I thought we'd have there. And uh, the Geronimo commander called me and was like, hey, sir, like, there's an infantry company that was like 200 meters from my ground line of communication. If I didn't get out now, I wasn't going to get out. Mm -hmm. And so that's what he did. He had to fight his way out. Uh, because uh, there was a, a company that had moved pretty far dismounted at night and was getting ready to cut them off. Uh, so exactly what we want. Um, exactly as yes. you planned it, <laughs> yes, right? Yes, sir. Exactly. <laughs> yep. Um, all right. What was the, uh, you know, what was the most painful thing about large-scale combat operations, you know, as, as a brigade staff officer? Like, what did you find? Like, wow, this is just way harder than I thought it was going to be. Getting everyone on the same sheet of music synchronizing efforts. I don't want to use a bunch of like hot words yeah. or whatever, but like just getting the team together on the same plan Which at the team? same time. The brigade like, team or the plans team? Or? The brigade team. Yeah. So like, you know, it's a big push from the plans who obviously makes the maneuver piece, but you have to make sure, hey, can we sustain this over time? How are we supporting it with fires? How, you know, bringing all like the S6, the S2, the FSO, the entire enterprise together, if you will, and making sure that we are synchronizing our efforts to inflict maximum casualties and maximum damage on the enemy. Yep. I think that was the, at least from my perspective, that was the biggest challenge. Yeah, if it was easy, somebody else would be doing it, right? Exactly, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, what about you? I would say, sir, just the anticipating of branch plans. So using our decision support matrix, providing the commander options, and when you're facing an enemy who's near peer to you and they have you know, overwhelming firepower as we do. We're taking mass casualties. So we normally plan an operation, rack and stack it. This is my main effort. They're going to seize the objective, no problem. And then you get the call from the co-ops floor that that main effort is is down to six people. B6 is looking at us for answers. So we were caught on our on our heels a couple times, you know, scrambling to come up with a plan. And, and you never want to plan for worst case scenario, but we have to provide the commander options that serve. If this doesn't go the way we think it's going to go, here's what we can do to still get after your intent. Yeah, and I thought, um, so I, I thought the decision support tools that the team developed were, were pretty good. Um, but, but you're right, like we found ourselves a couple times like having to generate options mm -hmm. using the rapid decision making process. Um, and, um, you know, what would you learn? What do you learn about wargaming? But, yeah, you have to plan for those those worst case scenarios um and, and we like to tippy toe around them because then it it buys more time in the war gaming or it, it, it kind of counter, counteracts your plan which as a pride thing you know you, my plan's perfect what do you mean this isn't going to work right um, but it's getting input from everybody um especially s2 um you know having them put on that red hat in the lisco environment and and really feeding us what reality could be on the ground instead of you know, three to one, we're going to win. Of course, we're going to take the city. I guess that's not really how it's going to going to yeah. work out every time. No, and, and you talked earlier about, you know, the fight to on and then beyond the objective. And so we, we did a pretty good job planning for actions on the objective. As you pointed out, like we had to uh, improvise a little bit mm -hmm. on the fight to the objective and then the fight beyond the objective. Yes, was we were really challenged with that yes sir um and because it's hard right if it was easy again somebody yes, else would be doing it um yeah and I, I uh it's it's it was it was fun frankly watching the team like wrestle with these problems not fun because i know it was like tiring and frustrating <laughs> but fun because it was a lot of growth Absolutely. and uh you know and i know um you know the brigade three the brigade xo the brigade commander had a lot of trust and confidence in you from a plan side and then from you uh really in the attack because like we we fought out of the attack a lot yes we did right um if you could go back in the way back machine back 90 days before you came to ltp you know what would you have spent uh, and i gave you a day on your own to do some more homework what would you do for homework on your own yeah. That's a tough one. I know. I, one right off the bat, sir, just 
looking at the maps of JRTC, being familiar with the terrain. <laughs> you're never, well, right. I mean, some, we are earth and surf, so. Some good IPB. Yeah, they may put us in an environment that we're not familiar with, but but generally we're going to know where we're fighting. we got to know that terrain. we got to know, yeah. you know, what the enemy, what's key to them and what could be key to us. Um, finding good spots for our attack, like not putting it in a low area where we can't get calms for 36 hours. Right. Um, I'd forgotten about that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We call that the yeah. dark ages it of was. JRTC. That's all it was I had the, the best ages. nap. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I mean, the, the modified combined obstacle overlay mm -hmm. for MBMP and then a graphic terrain overlay at the company level. Like, mm -hmm. this is one of the skills that's kind of atrophied uh, during, you know, our time fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan. And this place is punishing yes. if you don't use a Maku. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure, you know, we produced a Maku, but did it have the requisite detail? Yeah, I don't think so. And we only did one. It wasn't changing. We, were, we were blessed and did not get a bunch of rain, so the terrain wasn't changing much. Right. Um, but it's still our, our focus areas were changing, and, and just the how the battle was shaping changes the terrain as well. Absolutely. So, no, yeah. and you all did get over Yes. I felt like I, I failed know. you as the commander of operations group by not bringing a bunch of rain. Yeah. But, you know, when you look at the, you look at the terrain, particularly in the Northern Corridor, there's just, mm -hmm. you and you all defended primarily in the North. There's so many cross mobility corridors mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, in the Southern Avenue approach, like low water crossing five, and it's a big red, noisy, loud <laughs> wood chipper. Yep. Uh, and it's painful. Um, okay. What about you? Um, more rehearsals. Um, like so, at least when I, when I took this seat, it, within the first month we were out at something that we at the hundred first like to call division training densities. These infamous DTDs. Uh, that was the first time I ever got to take the our tech package out there, kind of see what it what it did, how it works, and then um, then really kind of start to codify the SOPs of what we want this thing to look like. And uh, one, another one of the big challenges with making it air assaultable. Before, it used to just be four JLTVs, which you can't do. Air assaultable? Yeah, like, what, is, what does air assaultable mean? So the ability to, to pick up two yeah. trucks, sling load them in into, you know, whatever HLZ, tuck into the wood line, and start doing command and control. Yeah. So that was the challenge that we faced, and it was, it was something that we got done out at our um, brigade validation, Bastone Phoenix. Now, we, we kind of got a better picture of what that looked like, but if I, had, if I was able to go back... Now, I would definitely do more rehearsals, tucking into the wood line, getting combo systems up, just validating our products that we fight off of there. Yeah. That, that's one thing we would, could have benefited from a lot, I think. No, I, and, you know, it's the one thing we can't get is more time, but, mm -hmm. but it's helpful and, and hopefully for, for folks that are listening. I mean, tack rehearsals, um, it's crazy, right? And you guys got so much more proficient over time with it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it, it makes a real difference, you know, uh, if we can get it down uh, to a very, very short window of time that we're fully operating capacity, camouflage, dispersed in the right place, you know, we're, we're able to see two a lot faster. And I love it, the dark ages. I, for, yeah. I totally had forgotten about that. I mean, it was only, it was really only about 10 days ago, but mm -hmm. you know, the this, and this gets back to the terrain analysis and, and the IPB to begin with is, uh, you know, analyzing the terrain of where we're going to be able to talk, identifying places that we think are, we want to put command posts in, potentially recon them so we create options for ourselves uh, going forward. And it's, it you know, buys us time in the long run. Um, okay, so here's what I would ask you. Uh, you know, Bastone 6, uh, he's getting, he's, I'm confident he's going to, you're going to be a troop commander here soon. You're going to be a company commander here. Um, you know, what, what questions do you want to ask me? I'm going to flip it around. What questions do you want to ask me about company or troop command? Because I've gotten to see a lot of companies and troops. That's a good one, sir. Per pertinent to JRTC, sir, or just Life. in general? Yeah. Life. Exactly. Okay. Um, I guess, okay, I'll kick off. So uh, relationship with your first sergeant, your right-hand man, your senior enlisted guy. Senior enlisted NCO, I should say. Yeah. Uh, how how did you find success in balancing kind of how you guys led the company as a team versus one personality overpowering another one? Well, so you know, folks listening, I had uh, I had Sergeant Major uh, Lamarcus Skip Knowles as my first sergeant, um, and he ended up being the division Sergeant Major for the A second. And he's a lot. Of, he is. He's awesome. A lot of personality. So when I came in, I was very much. Um, 
I was very fortunate. I took over from a phenomenal company commander. Uh, he ended up spending the rest of his career in special operations community. And so, I, I mean, I was really fortunate. I took command in Afghanistan in uh, 2003, and I had a first sergeant that had been with the company for nearly two years, uh, really knew the company well. And the advice that my dad had given me was like, hey, you command the company, let your first sergeant run the company. Mm-hmm. And so that's, that's what I did. Um, and, you know, number one is I think you, you really got to listen. Um, and, and it's got to be active listening. So I think, you know, company battery troop commanders have to ask questions. If you don't understand something, don't go with the flow. Hey, first sergeant, why did we do this this way? Not, not because like you want to change it. It's because you don't understand it. And if you understand it, like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. And then what you and that helps, I think you as a commander understand your role and what you're supposed to do. Um, and so I, I think it's a lot of dialogue. I think it's a lot of questions. I mean, you should be incredibly curious about everything as a company battery troop commander. And your first sergeant really has most of the answers. Um, I think on, on NCO relationships as well, is like, um, you don't need a friend, right? I mean, interpersonally, you, you may like click and laugh at each other's jokes, or you may not, and that's like okay. Um, it's not your first sergeant's job to be your friend. It's your first sergeant's job to be the company battery troop first sergeant. Mm-hmm. And so first and foremost, that relationship is, is, is that. It's got to be on that. It's got to you know, mutual professional respect and trust. Um, but um, you really need a first sergeant. So if your first sergeant doesn't, you know, wants to shut the door during lunch because that's how they regroup, like that's okay as mm-hmm. long as they're a great first sergeant and taking care of you know, the formation and your soldiers. Um, and I think sometimes like, uh, at times officers really want to be liked, uh, and that's not necessarily what your first sergeant wants or needs either. Um, and so, you know, but I do think, uh, sitting down and counseling your first sergeant, um, that's a dialogue, uh, and a good pro tip is go see your sergeant major with your draft counseling and sit down like, Hey, sergeant major. It's really uncomfortable. I'm going to sit down with First Sergeant Jones and I'm going to do counseling and I want to go through it. Uh, your Sergeant Major probably knows that First Sergeant better, you know, better than anybody else, can give you some good feedback of what your First Sergeant's good at, what your First Sergeant is still growing at, um, the, the dynamics of the company from the battalion perspective. And then, frankly, I mean, you got a Sergeant Major, Command Sergeant Major, super experienced, and is going to give you some good feedback on how to do that well. Uh, but you owe that to your First Sergeant. You owe them counseling. And so if you lay out like, hey, this is how I see the world. These are my expectations of you as the senior enlisted advisor. Um, and then also space and time in there for what are your expectations of me as the company commander of this formation? You know, where, you know, where do you think you're strong? Um, where do you think you're growing so that you as a team can complement one another and, and be highly effective? And that, that would be the advice I would give. And, I, you know, I was really fortunate. You know, I had Sergeant Major Jim Miller as, as my uh, battalion Sergeant Major, Big Jim. I mean, I still talk to that guy all the time. He still is mentoring and developing me. But he counseled me. I, I did that. And we sat down and spent a lot of time talking about how my role uh, in, you know, leading a company, um, counseling my first sergeant, counseling platoon sergeants, counseling squad leaders, and I got good counsel and feedback from my command sergeant major. And so that's that's the advice I'd give you. And I think you, know, you guys got a phenomenal sergeant major, brigade sergeant major and sergeant major Pena. I think, you know, having a conversation with him uh, before you take command is, I think, hugely important. And he's the kind of guy that's certainly going to make time for you. Yes, sir. Come to me. Sir, so I'm slotted against a troop that had recently had 20 people chaptered. Yeah. So I feel like the spotlight's on the troop. And I, it's a little intimidating to yeah. try to figure out how to flip that you know, flip the switch and, and get that troop going in the right direction. Yeah. So, so, um, you know, a perspective is, um, I, I firmly believe the streets always know, right? Soldiers in a company battery troop, like our soldiers are smart people Mm -hmm. and they know, they know what's going on in company battery troops. I mean, uh, uh, something I've done before is, you know, anonymously ask the formation, like, okay, 
who are the three people most likely to be in a car accident? Who are the three people most likely to receive an impact award for doing something awesome? And they know. I mean, they're like 80% are all making the same answers, right? They know. And so that's not to be punitive to somebody. That's to like, if we if we don't know as a company battery troop commander that, that Hardman is having a hard time, but, but all the soldiers know, mm-hmm. when we have to take that as an opportunity to get in front of it, to help that person before they have a problem. Um, you know, my, my advice to you is, and I've had some great mentorship, uh, you know, my brigade commander, uh, when I was a major, uh, breeder general retired, uh, Michael, and then, uh, and major general, uh, Beagle, now Lieutenant General Beagle, uh, as the division commander at 10th mountain division, you know, leadership is love. You got to love every single one of your soldiers. Now you've had people in your family and friends that have disappointed you in life. I am confident that you're going to have soldiers that disappoint you at some point, um, but you still got to love them. They're ours, right? And so, you know, you don't have any, any dirt bags in your formation. You have, you have human beings that have problems. You have uh, human beings that, that maybe this isn't the right career for them, and that, that's okay. It doesn't make them terrible human beings. Um, but it also means that we got to hold people accountable. Um, and it's about the good of the formation. And ultimately, um, you know, we got to do that because, you know, we talk about toxic leadership. It's not just people that yell. It's also people that don't hold folks accountable um, because if we don't hold people accountable. Uh, what we end up with is we end up with an overgrown lot mm-hmm. where we can't see the problems, where we can't, you know, keep things right and healthy uh, for our formation. And, uh, but we can do that in a loving way and we can do it in a way uh, where we still care about people, we treat people the right way, um, you know, and, and so, you know, I think you got to look at discipline standards. And, and the crazy thing is it starts with the smallest stuff, mm-hmm. you know, morning parade. So how do we inspect people every single day, right? And, and have we trained and certified people to do that? You know, if, if we're looking at a sergeant and say, hey, you should go inspect them, has anybody ever taught that sergeant actually how to do an inspection? And at your level, you're responsible for squad leaders. And so how do you prepare squad leaders to do that? You and your first sergeant have to train and certify them. You have to train and certify them to do counseling. You have to train and certify them to do inspections. And you should inspect something every single day. Your company should inspect things every single day. And this is, I think, the bedrock of where we get with discipline. Um, and then we retrain people when, when they're not meeting the standard, but we do it in a positive way. And then we recognize people when they're doing it really, really well, uh, would be you know, the advice I would give of where we, you know, everything starts with discipline. Um, and discipline's not yelling at people. Discipline's like we get people do the right thing without being told, right? It's a habit. And so we have to habit our organizations to do that. Cause if you cannot impose your will on your formation, in peacetime in garrison you shouldn't be surprised that you struggle to do it in combat and um, you know this idea that there's like good garrison or you know bad garrison soldier good combat soldier it's just not true a um, lot of combat and i haven't seen it to be true um, soldiers that do well at doing fundamental things have the right habits treat people the right way they're going to do those things in combat they're going to do them well in combat and the fundamental determinant of success or failure in combat it's how a soldier feels about his or her peers on their left or right and their immediate leader. And if they trust them and they're confident in them and they love them, they will die, they will kill for them. And that's ultimately what we have to do to be successful in combat. And it really, you all know this, you've been in the army long enough, how people feel about that tight group, this is my squad, that group, that's gonna determine it. That's, those are the people that are gonna push themselves harder in PT. Those are the people that are going to push themselves in training. Incidentally, it was awesome watching Bastogne live fire yesterday. Mm-hmm. You know, 98 degrees outside, 14 days into this thing, and people were moving out on objectives and getting it mm-hmm. done. And so, you know, that culture's here. We just got to build on that culture. And we probably have pockets where, you know, more in some places and less in others. But I just encourage you to build on that culture by focus on fundamental standards. And you'll be in a great place. And then just treat people the right way. Treat you know, you, um, you want your company battery troop to be the kind of place that you'd be comfortable one of your loved ones serving in. 
that's the standard. If it's not good enough for your, your brother, sister, your kids, your cousins, then it's just not good enough, mm -hmm. right? And that's that should be the standard that we hold ourselves to. Um, hey, I want to end this by just thanking both of you. This was awesome. You guys had a great rotation. Um, you know, I look forward to seeing what you're going to do as company troop commanders. I'm eager to see you here in those capacities at some point and uh, look forward to serving with you. And the lessons that you take out of here when your field grades, when your battalion commanders are going to make the difference for our Army. So proud of you and really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on The Crucible, the JRTC experience. The Joint Readiness Training Center is the premier crucible training experience. We prepare units to fight and win in the most complex environments against world-class opposing forces. We are America's leadership laboratory. Again, we'd like to thank our guests for participating. This podcast was created and produced by Mr. John Mabes. It was recorded and edited by Chief Thomas Rich and researched by First Lieutenant Anthony Cho. Intro vocals were done by Mr. Robert Chopper. Special thanks to Captain Jermaine Branch and Mr. Jeff England from Public Affairs. Be sure to like and follow us on social media to keep up with the latest warfighting TTPs learned through the crucible that is the Joint Readiness Training Center. Follow us by going to https colon forward slash forward slash linktr dot ee forward slash jrtc. We'd like to thank our partners at the Center for Army Lessons Learned of the Combined Arms Center, especially the JRTC Call Observations Detachment. Be sure to follow them on social media as well. Follow them at https colon forward slash forward slash www.army.mil forward slash C-A-L-L. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and review us wherever you listen or watch your podcasts, and be sure to stay tuned for more in the near future. The Crucible, the JRTC experience, is a product of the Joint Readiness Training Center.